going to talk a bit about digital footprint and managing your digital footprint and a few other bits and pieces about getting your research out there. I think building on the last two presentations before lunch, actually, they were remarkably good context set up and I've done half the persuading I need to do, I think. Um, so what is a digital footprint? Actually, start off with, who am I? Um, I'm Nicola Osborne, I'm from Medina, based at University of Edinburgh. More on that in a second. Um, so what is a digital footprint? Uh, basically, it's the data you leave behind when you go online in a very broad sense. So it's things like what you've said, what you've posted, what other people have said about you, what images you've been tagged in, what trail of kind of web crawling you've got, all kinds of bits and pieces, uh, including things that your institution puts out about as well. It's not just social media, although I'm going to talk a lot about social media today. Um, it's all kinds of things. And here we go. My digital footprint, to explain a bit more about who I am, uh, looks a bit like this. There's a blog where I've been posting stuff today, actually. Uh, there's my Research Explorer profile. Uh, there's my organisational website. Um, I've been knocking around as digital education manager for a couple of years, but before that I was a social media um, officer, and I still do kind of consulting and training in that kind of area, and research as well. So part of the reason I'm interested in managing your digital footprint is because I do research on how students manage their, their digital footprint and what the best practices are around using social media, around managing their online presence, around dealing with risk, that sort of thing. Um, I'm currently doing a bit of work on Yik Yak. If you want to know about that and the perils of trying to research something that is so cutting edge it starts to decide to not run anymore during your research, chat to me in a coffee break later. Um, uh, so I work on kind of educational technology, that sort of thing. Um, so first question, when did you all last search for yourself online? I, I'm not going to actually ask you now, I will ask you later when we have a bit of a discussion off camera. Um, uh, but this is a recommended reading thing. Uh, so if you happen to have Netflix, I recommend seeing uh, The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, Series 3, Episode 11, uh, where Kimmy Googles herself for the very first time. Uh, when you go out on the internet, you will find stuff about yourself, and there is usually something there that you do not expect, hence, oh fudge, um, very polite swears. Because uh, the risk here is that you basically have a fully searchable, full text archive of everything stupid you've ever said, right? So my classic example here is Mary Black's tweets. Um, she's also a classic example because actually uh, the impact on her reputation long term has not actually been that bad. But as a teenager, she was tweeting some quite interesting, colourful things, the least rude of which probably is maths is shite, uh, which any of you doing research with lots and lots of numbers in at the moment might agree with, I don't know. My, my feelings on research methods are mixed with maths. Um, but basically, you know, social media are long lasting and they're really ephemeral and you do not get to pick which they are on the whole. Things disappear unexpectedly, things stick around unexpectedly. She deleted these tweets uh, and people had screen captured them. And so they're still there, even though they're not still there, if you see what I mean. You don't get to pick. Um, and sometimes you don't know it's been screen capped, sometimes you don't know it's still out on the web, sometimes you've lost control of the stuff that's there because the site no longer is open for access, you've forgotten your password. There's all sorts of stuff that can stick around. When we did do our research on our students um, across at 20, uh, 14 and 15, we've actually just done another survey since, about 5% of the students in our research found stuff online they didn't expect to be there, which is disconcerting. That's quite a lot of people, really. 5% is quite a lot of our students finding unexpected stuff. I definitely have unexpected stuff online. Uh, thankfully, it's very low down my search <coughs> results. People don't go to like page 17 of Google. It's helpful. Um, and it's not just about thinking about what's happening now and your reputation now, it's thinking ahead to the future. So you will be aware, um, be ever increasingly aware of just how your data is being used in new kind of aggregations and new ways. So when you're thinking about what kind of content you put out there at any time, um, there's potential for it to be used in, in strange and interesting ways. So I think we're quite a long way, well, mm, from the Black Mirror nosedive episode, if anyone has seen that. Yeah, nodding, nodding. So that's essentially where everyone is getting rated and that's in real time and that's impacting on your ability to get on the flight. It's impacting your ability to get invited to a party. You have to have the right rating to get into those things. I say we're a long way from that, but I mean, I just got my most recent Airbnb review yesterday, which is essentially the same thing. You know, if I get lots of bad reviews, I am not going to be the person who they're going to give a booking to. Um, if I get a terrible review on eBay as a seller, then people are not going to buy stuff on me. So we're kind of already a bit there, but I think it's not quite taken over our lives in that way. And fingers crossed, we can disrupt a bit before it gets there. But you have to be aware of where things might be used in the future. And in the US, they've already agreed in Parliament uh, that your entire internet browsing history can be sold and data mined. 
And that sounds like a thing that would definitely never happen here, but we do have a new Investigatory Powers Act in the UK, which means that your ISP can keep all of your web browsing history for a year, and the law requires them to do that. Now, that's for terrorism checking and legal checking, but it's slightly concerning because once it's there, there's all kinds of things that can be done on that data. Um, there is a very nice paper uh, in, in PLOS, um, on PLOS one, in fact, uh, on responsible use of big data in research that I would recommend, by the way, if you're working on any kind of research in this area, if you're interested in how your work might be used in the future, anything we post in the future. Um, and some interesting interventions already out there. You can get a travel mode on your kind of password protecting apps so that when you go through customs, because in the US they're starting to ask for your social media credentials to get through customs. Oh yeah, it's optional at the moment, at the moment. Um, so this will essentially allow you to kind of take things off your phone while you go through there. Um, and then when Homeland Security are finished with you, switch it back on again. Uh, it's an interesting intervention. So this is my lightly scaring you part. There's gonna be the optimistic part in just a second. Um, uh, so what I will say is it is definitely okay to delete stuff. It is definitely okay to change settings. It is definitely, definitely okay to have awkward conversations with friends. Uh, I have said human liabilities, friends. Um, because actually there are people around you often who share stuff that is outside of your boundaries. You know what your boundaries are for kind of privacy. A lot of the time, sometimes people around you aren't as aware of that. And you might have those boundaries for really, really good reasons and it can be quite hard to explain those. So again, in our research, we found about 11% of our students um, had experienced unwanted tagging on photographs. Now, those might be really embarrassing drunken night out photographs, but they might be a really boring photograph. It might be a snap of someone at a conference who just doesn't want to give away the location or have an unflattering picture or anything to their left-hand side to be photographed. It could be any of those things. Um, so when did you last review your privacy and tagging settings? Mm, I'm going to leave that with you to think about. Um, and do you ever review your friends or your follows list? You know, is, does this still represent you and who you want to be? because sometimes who your friends are can impact on you. There are actually credit checking agencies in China and there's starting to be credit checking in the US that uses your kind of social network to decide whether you are credit worthy, which is an interesting prospect. I think we all have a few friends that might take down credit rating. So I'm gonna give you some very basic top tips and then really swing you into the positive chirpy side of things. Um, so some of my top, top tips, and this should be obvious after the Mary Black example, don't post anything stupid. I'm gonna encourage you to post lots of stuff about your work and to share with people. But when you're doing that, or midnight when you're in the pub, or when you're networking after the sessions today, um, you know, be sensible. Don't post really stupid stuff to start with. That's the easiest way of managing any of this stuff. Check your privacy settings. Don't panic. I mean, I am panicking you, and I am trying to scare you. I'm hoping that's working. But don't panic. Um, <laughs> The best way to do this stuff, to, to handle your online presence, is to crowd out the bad stuff with good stuff. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of my little bits, and that's what we can discuss at the end as well. Um, but for the stuff that is there that you don't want, you can remove it, you can untag it. If you want to, you can invoke the ease right to be forgotten and ask for it to be unfindable, which is a, a useful thing to be able to do. Um, rather than getting into a chat with trolls, I would avoid them. Seems obvious again, but you know, don't, don't rise to the bait. Uh, don't start using copyright stuff in inappropriate ways. I would hope with the kind of focus on publishing today that doesn't need saying, but it's worth saying. Um, check those phone settings. Check if your microphone on your phone is actually switched on for various apps. So if you see that Facebook is sending you uh, adverts that look disconcertingly like that last obscure conversation that you had, you might want to check your microphone settings. Um, Think about your data. Think about the legal issues and rights you have in social media, especially in terms of posting about other people. If you're going to make some flamey comment in the middle of a conference, which can happen, uh, probably don't, because that can still be libel. Um, at least make sure it's well-founded. Um, respect to the people I want to respect yourself. That's hopefully very obvious. And know what your footprint looks like, so search for yourself regularly. This is the like basic overview guide. But there's some really, really positive stuff about social media. I love social media. I'm all over the web. I spend all of my time telling people how scary the internet can be at the same time as going. And then you should get all over the internet because it's fabulous. Um, so while it's really useful for building up your professional presence, your academic presence, social media in particular, really easy way to get an appropriate and visible professional presence out there. Really helpful for doing that. A really good way to build your network and develop your network. Twice this morning, I've had meetings with people who said, you don't know me, but I know you on Twitter. And once I've done it back to somebody. Um, and uh, you know, it's a really good self-tailored route to finding new research and new information 
and finding out what's going on. So it's not just about the people, but the information that they share and the connections that you get there. I hope that's obvious a lot of you. I hope a lot of you are already using some of these tools in your own work. Um, they do enable collaborations. They enable you to engage with new audiences and allow you, allow you to participate in other kind of projects, including those collaborative projects that were being sort of discussed as collaborative opportunities before launch. Um, they can provide really interesting ways of thinking about new ideas to do something interesting with your research. Putting it out there, having a conversation about it, getting into that kind of nitty gritty of what the opportunities are, that can start conversations and take places you didn't expect. That's definitely happened to me with my work before now. It's an exciting way to kind of get feedback, as are conversations, but it's just another really interesting space to do that and to do that in front of other people a lot of the time. So you get feedback in a serendipitous kind of way. Um, and it gets you a chance to kind of share your own perspective because sometimes when you're writing academic work it's quite dry and you have to be quite measured in what you say and it's a collaborative writing process perhaps but maybe you don't get to get your voice out there and really speak to your passion and your enthusiasm and writing a blog post, writing a guest post, sharing a little video, that can be a lovely way to do that. Um, and it can raise your profile uh, of your work uh, whether it's within academia or beyond academia as well as your impact. I put the impact definition in there just for you all to enjoy. Um, and it is from the REF 2014 definition, but you know, we all want to see our work gone and do something useful, um, regardless of what the REF says. I think we all actually want that too. We want other people to hear about it. We want something practical to happen as a result of it. We want policy change. We want to do that sort of stuff. And the reason it's so useful in this way is because people go to social media for expertise and advice. Uh, they do go and search for stuff, they do go and ask people for stuff, they go and do the kind of lazy web thing where they kind of tweet out an obvious question and then get lots of helpful answers back. Um, you can use these kind of tools to tell stories in really new ways. Um, and I think that really was kind of sketched out really nicely just before lunch, actually, the kind of the ways in which you can tell stories in a different kind of way. I have some other examples for when we have a discussion if you want to see something sort of visual on that. Um, they rank really highly on search engines, so being extremely cynical, these are a really good way to get your authoritative web presence, that really lovely research profile, hopefully, that you have on your institutional website, um, or your professional profile on your own website, much more visible. If you're tweeting about it, if you're sharing about it, if you've got you know, blog posts pointing to it, much more visible. Um, they can let you get access directly to kind of principal investigators that you want to work with, to funders that you want to speak to. You can just have those direct conversations in a really helpful way. Also the press, really good way to make contact with the media, to get coverage of your work, to be the visible person people go and ask questions of. I had a very random phone call in autumn last year and it was to, have, oh, NBC is calling with a question about social media. I have no idea why they would think to come to me except for the fact that I have a presence out there, I have a lot of visibility, they can find me on social media. It's, it, you know, you get to be asked questions you really didn't expect to get and to get sort of interest in a really interesting way. It's inexpensive, except for your time, which I'm not about to suggest is inexpensive because time is really, really important. So there is an element of moderating how much time you spend and how you focus on these things. And I suspect there may be questions about that, so I shall let you come back to that. Um, I've said there are all these different tools. I've said they can be really powerful. I think the thing that makes them really useful is if you go in with a purpose, if you know what it is that you want to do with them, if you know who it is you want to speak to, who your audience is, what your goals are, what your audience expectations might be. Um, what would success look like? What would that mean to you? What is the thing you want to achieve? If you're making yourself more public, what is it you want to accomplish as a result of that? Um, what kind of voice do you want to have? Do you want to have a very formal one, a very informal one? Is it about engagement? Is it about being a very visible researcher. There's some very, very serious, very academically worded blogs around kind of mathematics where they just work out new mathematical problem solving. It is not aimed at a wide audience. It is very much a peer group audience. So, you know, you'll have different audiences for different purposes. Um, and just make use of what you have in terms of skills. If you're great with video, shoot lots of video. Um, if you're great with taking photos, do that. If you're terrible at either of those things, but you're really good at writing or you're really good at having conversations with people, use audio, use blog posts, you know, use the stuff you're good at. Unless you want to learn a new skill, but don't go and learn a new skill just to be in the space that you think is important, because doing a good job is, is much better. Um, and be creative and think about what else you could do. She said on the slides that are all mostly black and white with text on. But hey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I so mentioned audience, and I think one of the things that's really difficult sometimes is imagining who your audience is and where to find them. Uh, my top tip, and it is an obvious one, is to ask your audience where they hang out online. Um, when I was teaching science communication and public engagement, I made my students actually go out in a coffee break and just speak to a stranger on the street and ask them, where do you hang out online? 
And that was quite interesting <laughs> to get kind of results back from. But you'll normally know some people from your audience, whether those are peers, whether those are you know, extended family, whether those are people who you know are part of a community group. You can ask them, what is the space that you hang out in? What's the community that discusses this issue that I'm working on? How can I kind of connect with that? That is the most effective way to find your audience. Because guessing where they are or putting up a presence and hoping they find it, that, that's just not as effective. Um, and then you have to kind of make sure that what you do fits into those kind of expectations for your audience and meets your goals. Um, so you have to be kind of aware of how much time they have in terms of responding back to things. You have to think about what their needs are in terms of how you communicate stuff. So if you're talking to an audience that isn't used to academic language, you might have to explain things. If you're talking to like a patient information group who are like reading all the research at the same speed that you are, then you might be absolutely fine to use quite elaborate specific terms. It's going to depend again on them. Um, and you know, be open and contribute to their spaces because their spaces are well established and you're kind of new into them. So what tools do I think you should use social media wise? I think blogs are brilliant. They're really good for academic work. They let you share your process. They let you share what you're thinking about. They let you share why you are doing this work and why you're doing this work is really helpful in terms of understanding why you've gotten the funding, in terms of talking to other people in your institution. Also making your pitch, you know, you can, you can try things out in those spaces. Um, Twitter is brilliant for networking. It's brilliant for certain subject areas. It's not the right area for, for some subject areas. So, you know, if you want to go into the press, Twitter is brilliant. If you want to engage with other academics, it's great in law. It's good in law. It's good in medicine uh, in certain areas and not at all in other areas. Um, it depends a bit on kind of, again, where that community is. Uh, I'm a big fan of audio. Podcasts are like the... the the old school social media that is now all hot and sexy again. Um, if you don't listen to podcasts already, definitely have a listen. Have a think about what you could do. It's really inexpensive to record audio at a reasonable quality and get something out there. And it's a really nice way of having a kind of open discussion. Um, or do something way more creative. You can do much more creative things with podcasts if you want to as well. Um, think about images. Think about interactive spaces. Think about GIFs. I do like a GIF. Um, everyone likes a GIF. But also things like Figshare. Figshare is an interactive space. It is a social space. It's also one of the kind of tools you've heard about this morning. Um, it's a research space too. Um, and you can do the kind of semi-public spaces if that's right for your audience. If you're working with teenagers, then Snapchat is a good space to be in, but it's also a really risky space. So unless any of you actually are wanting to work with Snapchat, I'm not going to dwell further on all of the many things that can go wrong there, or I can catch you later maybe. <laughs> um, the other thing to say is that I don't know what areas you're all researching and working in. They will vary. Some of them will have professional guidance around what it is to be appropriate in your field. So I'll put an example of the GMC guidance. Uh, if you're a trainee nurse, from the first day you start your undergraduate nursing studies, you are expected to behave as if you are a professional in terms of how you conduct yourself online. There are really different guidances for different types of people. Um, if you're an employee of a university as well as, as a student, there might be social media guidance that applies to you as well. So just be aware of whatever's out there and make sure that anything you're doing that's new aligns with that um, and, and is appropriate to that. Most of these guidances though, they kind of want you out there sharing your work. They just want you to do it in the right kind of way and maintaining professional standards. So I'm going to say that an effective online presence is going to include all those authoritative web presence stuff that you already will have. The university research profiles, your staff page, you know, the Chris system, Pure, whatever you've got going on there. Um, your website, your own domain name if you have that. It's going to include a lot of professional engagement in social media channels, whatever form that takes. It's going to include your work out in the world, the journal articles, the presentations you do, the events I'm being videoed. That's part of my digital footprint <laughs> going on right there. Um, it's also going to include some offline elements too. The offline and the online don't sit separately. They work best when they're connected. Um, so we just done a big digital project last year. I'm going to show you an offline tangible thing. We did a comic book to share it. We made it a digital one and a print one because we know print's really useful. But we also know the project's mostly digital, but really hard to explain in text form. So I, I can have a flick through these afterwards if you like. Um, so, you know, the digital and the physical and all the other things you do go together in a really important combination. Um, now, I did want to talk a little bit about kind of persistence because it did come up earlier and I also am working on a project in this space. So, thinking about your, sort of your thesis, your publications, that sort of thing. Think about sort of depositing in the institutional repositories, in the open access repositories. I think you've had an excellent set of people telling you to do that today already, and I'm sure there'll be more. Um, the project I'm working on is looking at uh, reference rot, so when web links uh, go bad, <laughs> not like rogue, just bad. Um, so when something moves on the internet, if a page gets taken down, if someone deletes the tweet that they shared that you want to put in your research, um, that sort of thing. 
So we're working on a project to help people um, archive things as they discover them on the web so that they have a persistent copy of it available. Because you can make those things that are ephemeral persistent by archiving them, by referencing the right way, by using kind of the hyperlink protocol to reference them. So that's something I'm working on. If you're interested, drop me an email or give me a shout later. I'm going to give you a quick plug from MOOC. If you want to find out a lot more about digital footprints, you can also have a very delightful digital footprint badge, which I will happily give out at the end. Um, some shameless self-promotion. I'm also at the Fringe doing a show on online reputation and whether that hurts you, covering some of these topics and extending it a bit and scaring people more. And on that note, I would like to hand over to you for some discussion. Um, this is my kitten, cat, and his digital footprint because he's on Twitter and Instagram. Um, to just keep us cheery while we have a bit of a discussion. Um, so over to you, and I'm going to start with that question about when you last Googled yourself, and more importantly, when you last DuckDuckGo yourself, because DuckDuckGo doesn't use your cookies, so it doesn't give you the picture that you want to see. So, okay, over to you. I want lots of chat and discussion and hard questions.